start. Can I have your attention, please? So today uh, we release the first homework assignment. Um, and as I mentioned before, you, if you haven't had the experience before in solving uh, problems, you might find it uh, challenging, right? But please do attempt and do your best uh, to try to get as many problems as you can. And uh, you can ask me during my office hours uh, for, uh, uh, for hints if, uh, if you need them. So, but please don't do it by, via email because 710 students, uh, if I get 10% from 10% of you, emails, it, it will be a disaster. So just stop by my office uh, and I'll be more than happy to help you. And as I said, you, uh, of course, we will check for plagiarism, so you have to submit in machine-readable form. Uh, but you are allowed to talk to your colleagues, uh, exchange the ideas, especially if you are new to uh, problem solving. But if you just get the solutions without attempting them yourself. Yourselves, it will be very little use uh, of uh, these problems. They have only, they contribute only 20% of your uh, mark. Um, and uh, if you don't attempt them yourselves, uh, uh, you lose valuable opportunity to train for the exams. And on the exams, you will have problems similar to those that are given on homeworks. So let's go now back to serious stuff. So let me just quickly remind you um, our problem that we considered um, was how to multiply large integers in a fast way. And we, this uh, uh, visual representation This visual representation should persuade you that uh, there are all of n squared many elementary operations, right? If each x is multiplied by the other x um, in uh, constant time, then this will be uh, all of n squared many uh, operations. And so we try to do it we showed how Karatsuba uh, got to multiply large numbers in a faster um, way. So let me quickly remind you, he split a large integer into two approximately equal halves, right? Um, a most significant part and less significant part. And so number A can be represented as more significant part shifted n over too many bits to the left, plus a zero, and similarly for b. And now what Karatsuba um, realized is that in order to multiply a and b, you only need three quantities, namely a1, b1, a0, b0, and the sum total of the, so this sum, but not the individual factors A1, B0, plus A0, B1. And uh, of course, this uh, term can be uh, computed uh, with only one additional multiplication using the following trick, right? So please, uh, attending the lecture is not mandatory. If you are talking, you are distracting others. So please be fair and be sufficiently mature not to distract others. And I promise you, the hardness of the exam will be proportional to the loudness in the classroom. And I'm serious about that, okay? 
if, if you are talking, it means it's really simple what I'm uh, doing, so I have to make it harder. So uh, we compute um, this sum by multiplying the sum of A1 plus A0 with B1 uh, plus B0. And then we just subtract these two products, right? Because that will exactly give us the sum, right? A1, B0 plus A0, B1. So this is the algorithm. It's a recursive divide and conquer algorithm to multiply uh, A and B, two large integers, split them into more significant and less significant parts, sum up the more significant and less significant part, um, and then multiply first uh, less significant parts, then more significant parts, and finally multiply these uh, uh, two sums, u and v, and then you compute, of course, uh, uh, the final answer by shifting appropriately uh, these individual uh, products, right? Okay, most significant part and less significant part. More significant part if you break a, say, binary number into uh, two just by splitting the digits, uh, then those that correspond to the higher powers of two is the more significant part, and less significant part is those that uh, uh, correspond to the lower powers of two, right? So just... Uh, the right-hand side and the left-hand side part. So is ACE represented in terms of the binary bits? Uh, yes, um, even though, you know, f uh, it, you can represent it maybe even with uh, uh, bytes, but then uh, X times uh, Y, it depends what you call a uh, uh, elementary operation, but uh, for simplicity, uh, let's assume these are uh, all binary numbers. Okay, so how many steps does the whole algorithm take? Well, um, we can see that the algorithm satisfies the following recursion. Uh, T of n, so the work needed to multiply two n-bit numbers, was reduced to three multiplications of numbers that are approximately n over 2 bits. And this is the sloppiness uh, that I said that uh, um, we will kind of often do. Let's look again. Uh, what is the problem? You see, A1 and B1 are both n over 2 many bit numbers. However, this product, because A1 plus A0 can have n plus 1, many bits, right? If the both uh, two leading uh, bits were one, then A1 plus A0 will have actually n over two plus one bit. So, but this doesn't change the asymptotic behavior. So instead of putting here n over two plus one, possibly plus one, we ignore this and you just uh, trust my word that uh, this doesn't, this cannot change uh, the asymptotic behavior. And now, instead of doing any kind of calculation to find how Tn behaves, uh, we simply invoke the master theorem. So here we replaced one multiplication of two n-bit numbers with three multiplications of n over two-bit numbers. And this brings me, uh, I got a question um, from one of you. Uh, if, why in the master theorem A and B can be different? Uh, you see, in divide and conquer, you don't always uh, uh, split into equal parts uh, uh, say, if you have a problem of size n, you don't necessarily split it into two problems if si of size n over 2. For example, in Karatsuba, we actually produced uh, three 
uh, numbers of size approximately n over 2 that we have to pairwise multiply them, plus c of n, which is the overhead of shifting and adding the parts. So here a is 3, b is 2 for the master theorem, and f of n is just some constant times n. So this uh, pivoting polynomial is n to the log b of a, which is n to the log 2 of 3. Now, n to the log 2 of 3 is between 1 and a half and 1.6. So I can reduce uh, this n to the log 3 by any epsilon that is smaller than 1 half and still end up with the exponent that is larger than n. So the first case of master theorem applies and you get immediately without uh, any uh, additional calculation, the T of n behaves uh, exactly as n to the log 2 of 3, which grows slower than n to the 1.585. Log 2 of 3 is smaller than 1.585. So notice n to the 1.585. 585 is much smaller than n squared. So Karatsuba's algorithm, in fact, is uh, uh, considerably faster and, uh, in fact, uh, you can use it as a faster way of multiplying large integers than just by brute force. Of course, uh, uh, these software packages for uh, operating with uh, for arithmetic of large numbers implement even uh, faster methods. So, yes. Um, why is it between zero and zero point five? Okay, so good question. So why is it between zero and one point five? Log two of zero point five. Zero point five. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and so log two of three is you can just compute it. Uh, uh, using your calculator, it's uh, uh, 1.5849 and so forth. So it is bigger than 1.5, but smaller than 1.6, okay? Because it is bigger than 1.5, if I subtract 0 0.5, log 3 minus 0 0.5 will be still bigger than 1 which means that it will still grow faster than the overhead. I cannot subtract, for example, 0 0.6 because log 2 of 3 is smaller than 1.6. So if I subtract 0 0.6, I'll get something smaller than 1. So this expression will no longer dominate C times N. That log, uh, that's right, so the reason is that log, uh, sorry, uh, log 2 of 3 minus that quantity is bigger than 1. That's correct. Okay? Because log 2 of 3 is 1.585 and so forth, if I subtract something smaller than 0.5, I am guaranteed to get the quantity that is uh, still larger than one, okay? Okay, so now the question is, uh, if this works so well, any other questions, are you with me? Did you understand this uh, point why we choose epsilon to be smaller than 0.5? Right? Okay. So, maybe if we are, uh, maybe if we break uh, the numbers into three pieces, uh, maybe we will get even faster algorithm. So let's give it a try. So assume that you have, so the, here you have k bits of A2, k bits of A1, k bits of A0. Simply what I've done, I partitioned uh, A into approximately equal thirds, right? So now what's, what is A then? 
a is a2 times 2 to the 2k. If here you have k many bits, this means on the right of it you will have 2k many bits, so you have to uh, shift a2 for 2k many bits to the left. a1 you have to shift for k many bits to the left. And finally you add 0, right? So if you call this a2, a1, and a0, then a is precisely this equal to this expression. And you can do the same for b. And then you end up with, when you multiply a and b, you end up with this expression. You can easily just multiply by hand and verify that you get uh, these expressions. Now notice, trying to replicate Karatsuba's trick, we now notice that how many numbers do we need to reconstruct A times B? We need only five numbers. We need A to B2. Then we need this sum, that's the second. Then this sum, that, that's the third. This sum is the fourth. And A0, B0 is the fifth quantity. So I need only five quantities to reconstruct the product. So maybe just as in Karatsuba streak, maybe just having five multiplication is enough. So how would you obtain all these quantities using only five multiplications? Uh, maybe, so let's call these coefficients a uh, C0 to C4, and the question is, can we obtain them with five multiplications only? Well, maybe, if we just try to mimic the Karatsuba streak, maybe we add up all the parts, uh, all the three parts, multiply them, and we get this expression, but then how do you, what else do you get, and are you sure that you will end up being able to solve for these five quantities? Uh, so now I'll show you a very important trick that is used in extremely important uh, algorithms, uh, such as algorithms for fast evaluation of a convolution, which is uh, bread and butter of signal processing. So without any guesswork, I'll show you how to compute all these five coefficients using only five multiplications, right? Because we have only five coefficients necessary to obtain a, b. So here is the trick. Uh, let's just again represent a and b in this form. Now, what we are going to do we are making our life more complicated in order to make it simpler, okay? You see, this is an ancient kind of strategy in mathematics. In mathematics, often you embed one structure into a larger structure which has more regular properties than the original structure. For example, if you have a polynomial, say, of degree 5, it might have only um, one or, say, three or five real roots, right? And other roots might be, might, it might not have other uh, real roots. But uh, so we cannot factor uh, any polynomial within reals. But if we embed reals within complex numbers, uh, then any polynomial of degree n has precisely n roots, and thus you can uh, represent it as a product of linear factors. So um, that's exactly the same trick. So here we embed numbers into, uh, we extend them, we embed them into a polynomial ring, what is called. Why is this so? Because polynomials have richer properties uh, that will allow you to do faster algorithms. 
So how do we obtain these two polynomials? Well, we simply rep uh, replace 2 to the 2k with x squared um, and 2 to the k, of course, by x. And then notice that our numbers are precisely the values of these two polynomials at 2 to the k. So a is simply pa evaluated at 2 to the k because if I substitute x with 2 to the k, I'll get exactly 2 to the 2k and 2 to the k here, right? So now our strategy is as follows. We will, rather than multiplying integers, we will find a fast way to multiply polynomials because once we evaluate this polynomial, if we find the product P of A times P A of X times P B of X, say this is this polynomial with the coefficient some unknown value C, then to multiply A and B is essentially multiplying these two polynomials, the values of two polynomials at 2 to the K. But this is the same as evaluating the product polynomial at 2 to the k, yeah? right? Because PA of x times PB of x, if you find the product, then PA of 2 to the k, PB 2 to the k will be precisely this, the value of this product polynomial at 2 to the k. So all what we have to do now is to find a way to f uh, multiply polynomials in a fast way. Okay, so let's see now. Um, polynomials PA and PB are both of degree 2. So their product is of degree 4. How many values do we need to know of a polynomial of degree 4 to, to uniquely determine him, it. Five. five values, exactly. A linear polynomial needs two values, just two points for a line. For a parabola, you need three values and so forth. So all you need is just five values. So instead of multiplying these huge numbers, P A two to the K times P B of two to the K, I will find some as small numbers as possible to evaluate my polynomials to get the five values of the product. So by absolute value, what would be the smallest possible five integers to evaluate my polynomials? Exactly. So the, they would be minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. So the trick is now, I will simply compute PA at minus 2. Instead of computing PA and this gigantic value 2 to the K, I will simply compute PA at minus 2, then PA at minus 1, PA at 0, PA at 1, PA at 2. Right? And the same with PB. But notice, this is doable in linear time. Why? Well, if you substitute minus 2 here, this is what you get, but this simplifies into 4a2 minus 2a1 plus a0. This doesn't involve any large number multiplications because even though a2 is a large number with k many bits, because 4a2 is just 2a2 plus 2a2, and addition can be done in linear time, and likewise 2a2 is uh, just uh, a2 plus a2. So this multiplication of large number by a constant is reducible to addition, and thus it's doable in linear time. So these are the, so to speak, Karatsuba, expressions that we have to um, multiply pairwise because we can do exactly the same 
for the polynomial PB, right? Now what we do, we will now pointwise multiply the values of these two polynomials. So, what do we have? We computed in linear time PA at minus 2 and PB at minus 2. And then we can compute PC at minus 2 simply by multiplying the values of PA and PB. Right? <coughs> but we saw that these are precisely these uh, simple expressions, right? Similarly, for uh, PC at minus 1, we have to evaluate this product. So notice, so here we will do this addition in linear time and then use only one large integer multiplication, right? And you repeat this for all five values. So now, we know that the product is of degree four. So, and we have uh, its four values. Well, if you substitute uh, uh, in this expression uh, x with minus 2, with minus 1, with 0, with 1, and 2, you have to get these values that you have already computed using only five large number multiplications. Right? So, if you simplify this, this is what you get. You know that your coefficients have to satisfy these equalities. These are just the products uh, PA minus 2 times PB minus 2 and so forth. Right? But what is this? This is simply, these are unknowns. PCs, you obtain them using five multiplications of large numbers. And this is a simple system of linear equations, which you can solve explicitly. And if you do that, this is what you get. So your coefficients of the product can be obtained from these five products using this formula, right? And in this way, you, you obtain all the uh, five coefficients. Now you simply substitute x with two to the k, but this evaluation is just shifting for k many bits, 2k many bits, 3k many bits, and 4k many bits, right? And voila, you get the product of a times b using only five multiplications. Yes? Um, why solving the linear equations in uh, linear time? Okay, so to solve uh, this in linear time, this is an explicit formula that tells you how to do it, right? You can put this to the greatest common denominator. On the top, you will get a linear combination of these values with small coefficients, right? And because you have to get an integer, uh, the um, multiplier in the, uh, in the uh, denominator will uh, cancel out uh, the 12 on the bottom, right? The formula, you obtain this formula simply by solving this system of linear equations, say using Gaussian elimination, right? If you have this, you can first substitute C0 everywhere and eliminate C0. Then you can solve for C1 and replace it everywhere and so forth. So this is just a system of linear equations that if you solve it explicitly, produces precisely this. It's, it is in linear time, right? Because uh, it will take as much time as proportional to the number of bits uh, uh, in these uh, products, right? Because all what you have to do is form a simple linear combination of these values and then divide by an integer. This is all doable in linear time. Yes? Sorry? X, X is a form of 2 raised to power k. X is a form of 2 raised to power k. 2? Sorry. Uh, X is a form of 2 raised to power k, right? 2 to the power of k. Oh, yes, yes, yes. 2 to the power of k. Sorry, old people are a little bit deaf. So how can X take negative values of minus 2 and minus 
Okay, so this, the reason that these guys come, you have guarantee not only that they will be positive, but that they will be also integers because they correspond to the digits of the product which is, uh, contains only positive integers. So you have a guarantee just for theory that this will be positive integers simply because of what they correspond to. They are the coefficients of the polynomial. Okay. So once you get the coefficients, you easily evaluate uh, uh, the product by substituting 2 to the k uh, in this uh, expression. Okay, so look, what we are doing is non-trivial. So please, make sure you read the slides thoroughly because the material will be highly non-trivial. Right? Algorithms are used to solve difficult problems. So please don't let the material accumulate. Uh, read them, uh, read the slides, and uh, if uh, you have problems, come to my office hours. If there are too many of you, I'll just uh, send you to go jump from the Sydney Bridge, okay? <laughs> uh, I'll have a few tutors uh, to, uh, to help me if necessary. But please make sure you follow everything, okay? So, here is the algorithm for you to uh, kind of rec rec uh, recapitulate. So first what we did, we split the, all the digits in three equal contiguous groups, right? Both for A and B. Then we construct these uh, two polynomials uh, so that the parts of A and parts of B are the corresponding coefficients of these quadratic polynomials. Then what we do, we compute P of PA at minus 2. How? I simply substitute X with minus 2 and do the arithmetic and I get 4A2, right? 2 squared is 4, so 4A2. Sorry, here, uh, yeah, it's minus 2, so minus 2A1 plus A0. Similarly, I substitute minus 2 here in PB, then I substitute minus 1 and I get this, obviously. I substitute 0, if I substitute 0, <coughs> excuse me, uh, both of these two parts disappear and you simply get A0 here and B0 here and so forth. Then you multiply the values of PA and PB. PA minus 2 with PB of minus, uh, minus 2. These are, this is the only place where two large numbers are multiplied because uh, you have no control how big are these parts, right? They have k many bits and k can be arbitrarily large. So these are the five multiplications where both operands are large, right? But only five of them. Then we solve the corresponding system of linear equations, as I showed you before, which means that you simply evaluate C0, uh, C1 using these explicit formulas. And then you substitute x by uh, 2 to the k, and these amounts of simply shifting and adding uh, these number c's, and lo and behold, the product that you get is a times b. Great, so how fast is this algorithm? Well, let's see. We have replaced a multiplication of two n-bit numbers with five multiplications of approximately n over 3 bit numbers with a linear. Why is it only approximate? If you look back at the algorithm, why is uh, the, this multiplication, multiplication of uh, 
two approximately k, uh, k bit numbers. How many bits can they actually have? Uh, PA at minus two and PB at minus two. They can have slightly more bits because you add, so for example here, uh, this four will add two bits to A2. This will add one bit to A1 and plus A0. So all together you might get, I don't know exactly, you can evaluate yourself, say five or six extra bits at most, right? So this recurrence is not quite true. I should have said here P of N over three plus say five or six. Uh, you can uh, calculate this explicitly, right? But as I said, this uh, uh, adding a constant here doesn't change the asymptotics of the solution, right? So now we can apply the master theorem and uh, here A is five, be so because we replaced one multiplication of two n bit numbers with five multiplication of numbers that have approximately n over three many bits. Right? So if I apply my uh, master theorem, a1 is five, b is equal to three. So the critical, the pivoting polynomial is n to the log three of five, which happens to be n to the power one point four six five and again master theorem case one applies because this is linear and this you can reduce for a, by any number smaller than say 0.465 and you will get still something bigger than n so first case applies and lo and behold you get that this algorithm runs in time n to the power 1.47 and remember, for uh, when uh, with Karatsuba's algorithm, we had n to the 1.58, and now it's only 1.47. Yes. Um, why? Okay, when it comes to the master theorem, yes. why do we always consider n to the power of log base two of three? Why is base b? Yeah, base b of three. Yes. Base You, so you are asking where the power n to the log uh, three of uh, five, where this came from in yeah. the. Where did you get the? Okay. Well, you didn't look at your notes for the proof of master theorem. <laughs> uh, in order to figure out that, I am afraid you have to suffer through the calculations because otherwise you cannot see it. And that's what I told you that the value of mathematics is, allows you to quote unquote, to do things that you don't fully understand. If you just look at master theorem, you will never see exactly where this came from for this particular case. You have to do the algebra and lo and behold, this comes uh, you remember when we unwound uh, the master theorem, the recurrence, uh, A kept getting larger and larger powers. And at the end, the largest power was uh, log B of N. But A to the power log B of N, you use now the fact that you can swap N and the base. Uh, and you get N to the log B of A. So this is a short uh, explanation, but if you want to uh, have epiphany, you have to read the proof. Uh, yes. To go back to the algorithm. Yeah. Uh, so in step six, all those divisions there, uh, wouldn't that complicate things? Because it looks like you have some floating point for uh, You know what? Uh, if you take the greatest common denominator, and you compute the linear combinations that you get on the top. Because the results are digits of a number, you have to get integer 
result. And you can, of course, divide whatever you get for the linear combination. You can divide by 24 in linear time. Right? So this, of course, has just you use regular long division, right, to divide one number by another. Sorry? We haven't defined that division. Like, would it take linear time? Or? Well, uh, as a homework problem show that uh, if you know if the uh, quotient is an integer, show that you can do the division in a linear time. Because you always shift for, you know, for a few bits of this 24, and you can shift it only linear many steps, so this can be done in linear time. Okay, so now, let's be greedy. We got a significantly faster algorithm. Then why not slice numbers A and B into even larger number of slices? There should be a trade-off between the number of slices and the amount of slices. If you simply have efficiency. Ah, so here is a good comment. There will be a trade-off between the number of slices with the size of constants. And that's a crucial observation. So let's see. Uh, so in a sense, uh, the answer is, uh, yes, you both get a faster algorithm, and you also don't get the faster algorithm. How is this possible? It is theoretically faster. In the sense that if you were really multiplying gigantic, gigantic numbers, right, it would be, it would run in smaller asymptotical time, in a slower growing asymptotical time, but the constants involved in the asymptotic will become gigantic. And thus, this will render the algorithm useless for practical applications. And so this is, uh, this um, idea of dividing in more and more slices is useful for two reasons. Uh, because it's a perfect example how if you just worry about asymptotic growth, how you can, uh, how you can get screwed. Uh, and also we will localize what causes this explosion of constants. And this will tell us how to fix it. And this will lead, uh, lead us to the most important algorithm today, which is called Fast Fourier Transform. Uh, now, I have to kind of prepare you for that. Fast Fourier Transform will involve complex numbers and a little bit of mumbo jumbo, but if you use a mobile phone, what are you doing? Either you are talking, in which case uh, your voice is uh, what, your, uh, what your mobile phone does. It finds fast Fourier transform of the samples of your voice. Or you are looking at images, uh, in which case these images are encoded using JPEG. And lo and behold, JPEG is best based on fast Fourier transform. And in gazillions of other applications. And it's an excellent example of a divide and conquer algorithm. But instead of being something silly, it's actually the algorithm that by, uh, there is absolutely no other algorithm whatsoever that is executed as often as fast Fourier transform precisely of this multimedia business and communications business uh, that is fundamentally based on that. So for that reason, please suffer through a little bit of technicalities because the, the reward is great. And after we finish fast Fourier transform, we will have a Dolby engineer who will come and demonstrate some very cool uh, sound processing and maybe even image processing applications. 
And uh, people who do the best in my class get a chance to be interns at Dolby. Okay? So, and I can tell you in 90, 95 or 6, I visited Dolby Labs and their head engineer, Louis Fielder, told me that when he finds a competent computer scientist who understands FFT, he hires him on the spot. So, for some reason, for computer scientists tend to be mad at worse. But turn this to your advantage, right? If you understand this fundamental algorithm, you dramatically increase your employment. Even in, you know, whenever you study time series and things like that in like stock market business, and you, you encounter FFT. So rather than me showing you some kind of silly little algorithms that, uh, are seldom executed, I choose algorithms that run out there, right? But uh, of course there is this trade-off that you have to suffer through a little bit of technicalities uh, because you cannot make uh, a rocket to go to the moon in your garage, right? You need sophisticated machinery. And this is a uh, fast Fourier transform is uh, an example of this. Okay, so let's go back to um, this problem of why not divide uh, our number into more slices. For example, here I split both A and B in N plus one many slices. So the slices are called AN, AN minus one, all the way to A zero and assume that each has k bits, approximately. As I say, we will be sloppy and assume that uh, you can perfectly split in uh, um, uh, n plus one many equal slices so that we don't worry about uh, round offs. Okay, so then what would we do? Just mimicking what we have done already, we will introduce polynomials that are built with the coefficients that correspond to the slices of our numbers. And our trick will be the same, namely, we will look for ways of efficiently multiplying these two polynomials and once we find the product polynomial, then at the very end, we will evaluate it at 2 to the k yeah, to get the product a times b, right? So it's exactly the same structure of the proof. So as before, our number a is just the value of p of a at 2 to the k and uh, Similarly for B and the product AB, and now that's the crucial part, is the product of PA at 2 to the K times PB evaluated at 2 to the K. But multiplying the values of two polynomials is equivalent to first multiply the polynomials with free variables and only then evaluate, replace X with 2 to the K. So for that reason, what we want to do is we want to find a quick way of multiplying two polynomials of degree n. And the trick is the same. Uh, we will compute the product of these two polynomials by evaluating these two polynomials at small numbers. Right? Uh, to repeat the trick that we just did before. So let us see. So if you look at the polynomials PA of X times PB of X, the polynomials are of this product, uh, will be of this form where the degree is now 2n. So to give you an example, here is the product of two cubic polynomials, this is what you get. Now, tell me what 
interesting feature do you see that all of these terms share? How are these guys related to the power that they multiply? Yeah? Exactly. So the sum of indices of all terms is precisely equal to the power. So uh, this is what we have. Uh, the product is a polynomial whose coefficients are all sums, uh, sorry, are sums of all products where indices of A terms and B terms sum up to the power. So this is what you uh, get. Cj will be simply equal to this sum of the products of the factors whose indices sum up precisely to j. And the trick is now how to obtain all Cj's without performing n squared many operations. Now, this sequence, so you can think of uh, uh, an, uh, sorry, sequence an and an minus 1 up to a0, and another sequence bn, bn minus 1, b0. Then the sequence of cj's that is obtained in this way is a sum of all products where indices uh, uh, sum up to precisely j is the most important operation that you can have in, uh, that you will see in this course, and it is called linear convolution. Uh, why is it so important? It is important for the following reason. You see, I have a neighbor who listens to loud music. And that is not my biggest pain. My biggest pain is that he likes to rock the building with bass sounds. So what I do, I'm in my bed trying to get some sleep and I can hear just woof, 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 woof. Okay, and I feel like, um, I won't say how I feel. <laughs> okay, so what he does is, he passes the regular sound that sane people listen to through a filter that amplifies the bass frequencies uh, and leaves, uh, say, mid-range and high range unchanged. In order to do that, his computer or whatever sound system does the following. It takes samples of the sound that come from either MP3 or from a CD player, whatever, and computes convolution of the samples of the sound with the coefficients of that filter. So, and the output sound is the stream of these CJs. So, the multiplication of polynomials wouldn't be important if it's just about polynomials. But multiplication of the polynomials is essentially applying what's called linear filters to band-limited signals. And so all of your phones, when you, you know that you can choose on your phone whether you want it to sound as an open-air concert or a small, um, small uh, listening room, right? Uh, what the, your phone does, it convolves the original signal with the, what's called impulse response of the room, right? So in short, uh, I'm showing you this because it's absolutely crucially important operation. Okay, so now to go back. This is all about my neighbor's music. <laughs> and... Uh, so this is what fast evaluation of convolution is based on. You see, every polynomial has split personality. Okay. One aspect of its personality is its coefficient representation. 
an times x to the n plus an minus 1 x to the n minus 1 and so forth. That's one way to define a polynomial. Another way of defining a polynomial of degree n is simply to give n many values of that polynomial. Now, both aspects, both ways of representing polynomials have good aspects and bad aspects. Good aspect of coefficient representation is that when I give you a value, you can quickly replace the variable with that value, do a linear time computation, and obtain the value of the polynomial. Right? Bad feature is that if you, that it is hard to multiply two polynomials given in the coefficient form because this evaluating it by brute force involves n squared many multiplications of the coefficients, right? On the other hand, if I give you the polynomial by values, it's totally trivial to multiply two polynomials given by values. How? If I have p a of x and p b of x, how? Oops, sorry. How do I find uh, what is happening here? Uh, how do I find the values of the product? Well, I simply multiply pointwise. If I had the same set for values uh, of the polynomial p b then the product will have the values that are exactly the products of values of the two polynomials. So it's easy to multiply two polynomials in a coefficient, sorry, in a value form, but it is hard to evaluate them. For example, if I give you this n plus one many values and then pick a value that is between two adjacent values and ask you what's the value there, that's hard to compute. That's called interpolation, right? So our trick will be you take polynomial in the coefficient form, you evaluate it at small inputs, then which gives you representation through values. Then you multiply in the value form point by point and then you compute back the coefficients. So in this way, you take advantages of both roles, what is, uh, accordingly, what is fast in each of these roles. Okay, let's make five minute break, and then you will see more mysteries of uh, mul polynomial multiplication. We, we don't need to uh, know the proof of the Markov theorem, but we know. No. But we have.